Hi, hey everyone. Um, we're just going to give it a couple of moments to let people sort of filter in from the um, the waiting room. So thank you for joining us. And let's just give it a couple of minutes before we <coughs> get <coughs> Is that camera off? No. Okay. All right. Okay, brilliant. I think let's make a start and inevitably I think people will, will join us. But I think I know that there's lots of ground that we want to cover today. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, good evening and thanks for coming along to the final session of the Black British Artists and Political Activism Public Lecture Course. <clears throat> My name is Lizzie Robles and I'm a lecturer at the University of Bristol. Um, and together with a wonderful team at the Paul Mellon Center, I've had the pleasure of Convening for previous sessions, we've op opened up some of the issues and tensions that arise at the perforated boundaries between art and political activism. We've heard from artists, including Ingrid Pollard and Gavin Yatches, and considered the ways in which the relationship between art and the world, to borrow from Stuart Hall, might be read through the examples of the lives and work of artists such as Rashid Areen and Ronald Moody. Uh, tonight, it's my very great pleasure to introduce you to our speakers for this evening, the artist Marlene Smith and the art historian Alice Correa. Dr. Alice Correa is an independent art historian. Her research examines late 20th century British art with a specific focus on artists of African, Caribbean and South Asian heritage. She's published articles in art history, British art studies, sculpture journal and third text. In 2017, she was a mid-career fellow at the Paul Mellon Center for the Study of British Art, where she initiated her ongoing research project, Articulating British Asian Art Histories. She's currently coming to the end of a research fellowship at the Decolonizing Arts Institute in London, and is also working as a research curator at Touchstones Rochdale on a major exhibition project titled The Radical Decade, Rochdale Art Gallery in the 1980s. And to briefly pause my introduction, I realized I forgot to do the housekeeping. Sorry, you'd think after six weeks of this, I would remember the basic order of events. Um, <clears throat> so the lecture, uh, this conversation will be followed by an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, so I invite you to put those into the Q&A box using the Q&A function on your screens. Uh, the session will be recorded and made available at a later date um, on the Paul Mellon Center's um, channels so keep your eye out there and um, closed captioning is available if that's something that you need uh, you can click the cc button on your screen to enable captioning um, right so on to the rest of the introduction so to now introduce marlene smith uh, marlene's an artist and curator in the early 80s she was a member of a group of young black artists that included eddie chambers keith piper and claudette johnson that under the name the Black Art Group organized a series of exhibitions under the title The Pan-African Connection and a series of seminal conferences, including the first National Black Art Convention at Wolverhampton in 1982, and later the Working Convention for Radical Black Art. She's taken on curatorial and organizational roles at the now storied Black Art Gallery based in Finsbury Park, before taking on the directorship of the public in West Bromwich. More recently, together with Piper and Johnson, she formed the Black Art Group Research Project to examine afresh the archives and historical legacies of the Black Art Group and the milieu that has come to be known as a British Black Arts Movement, uh, more broadly via a series of interventions, including an exhibition in 2012 at the Graves Gallery in Sheffield and an international conference at the University of Wolverhampton. During 2015 and 18, she completed a PhD examining the role of uh, women's exhibition history played during that decade in shaping the art of the time. During this period, she was also UK research manager for the AHRC funded Black Artists and Modernism project supported by the Art Fund, a three year research scheme focused on the relationship between the work of artists of African and Asian descent and modernism. 
She is director of The Room Next to Mine, an associate of the Making Histories Visible Project and associate artist at Modern Art Oxford. Marlene's work together with a short film that she's produced can currently be found in the exhibition Cut and Mix at the New Art Exchange in Nottingham. And as a member of the Black Art Research, uh, Black Art Group Research Project, she is working um, with the team at the Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games to realize a project next year, uh, more to be announced soon. So keep your eye out for that. Um, anyway, enough from me, over and welcome. And thank you so much for coming, um, Marlene and Alice. I leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lizzie, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I've got some slides, so I will share my screen. Okay, hopefully everyone can see those. And, um, right, so I move forward. Here we go, okay. So um, I'm really looking forward to speaking to you today, Aline. Um, hopefully we can have really fantastic generative conversation. Um, uh, just so everyone knows at home, um, we, Marlene and I have talked through some of the slides um, uh, previously in preparation for today, but um, we're going to perhaps draw out some things that we haven't touched on before. Um, but the title of today's session Black British Artists and Political Activism, She Is Not Bulletproof, takes its title from a mixed media installation that Marlene created for the hugely important exhibition, The Thin Black Line, curated by Labena Hibbard and staged at the Institute of Contemporary Art from November 1985 to January 86. Um, the exhibition included a range of um, uh, artists working in a range of media, including paintings, photography, sculpture. And the exhibition itself knowingly acknowledges the ways in which Black women artists are marginalized um, to liminal transitionary spaces within art institutions. Um, Marlene, you've told me previously that um, you made the piece Good Housekeeping One. Um, uh, uh, shortly before making this piece, you'd been on a march in protest at the shooting of Cherry Gross by police in her home in Brixton in 1985. So to start with, I wondered if you could just sketch perhaps the political context in which you were working um, at the time and how that might have informed your approach to art making. I'm sure we'll pick up some of those themes and ideas, but just as a general introduction, um, uh, over to you. So by the time that I was taking part in Thin Black Line, I'd already been a member of the Black Art Group since 1982. So I'd had three years really of working with Claudette, Eddie, Keith and Donald and um, the other two female members of the group at the time were Wenda Leslie and Janet Vernon. So we'd so the, thing, so the Black Art Group had done both um, conventions by that point. So in 1982, when I first joined, we were, we were working towards the first National Black Art Convention, which was at Wolverhampton. And in 84, we did a smaller um, convention that was in Nottingham. Um, and that was the working, we, we wanted to, we, we were trying to make it into more of a working event than the first one had been but that wasn't particularly successful um, but in terms of the context um, I think just re recalling the fact that I'd been on this march and that those ideas were trundling through my head at the time that I was making this um, probably gives you the best kind of um, overview that I could offer you as to what led to me making um, Good Housekeeping One. Okay. Um, I was, I'd taken a year out of, of my studies, so I was still on the books at um, Bradford School of Art. Um, and I, I'd rushed down to London because I felt as though everything was happening in London. And I felt really isolated up in Bradford because 
even though there were other black and brown faces on the course that I was doing, I didn't really find anybody in Bradford who was as politicized as I was. When I say politicized, what I mean is that I was really paying attention to what was happening in the news. I was really paying attention to what was happening on the streets in the UK. And the shooting of Cherry Gross um, really was a focal point, not just for me, but for lots, I think, of lots of young black people. Because what, what, what had been happening was that because of SUS, the SUS laws, um, the police really seemed to have, it was like um, they, they were having a free for all. And, you know, young black people, especially young black men were being stopped and searched all the time. That was a really difficult, difficult period. So those are the things that I think about when I think about 1985. Um, I think about SUS and about policing and poor policing, but also the other context I think that was international for us was the context of South Africa. Um, so the two things that I remember going on marches about during the eighties were um, the, the, march, the, the, the march that happened in protest against what had happened to Cherry Gross and, the, and several marches around apartheid and uh, around um, immigration. So one of the things that I also did around this time was I joined a tour of the Sari squad. And the Sari squad was a bunch of really dynamic and political Asian women mostly, who um, were campaigning for Afia Begum. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the details of her immigration case, but she was, she was somebody who was in danger of being deported back to Bangladesh. I think it was Bangladesh that she was from. So I saw myself very much at, um, in 1985. And in 1985, I was what, 20, 21? Um, I saw myself very much as somebody who was politically interested, um, both in what was happening locally, nationally, and in the international aspects of the news. And, particularly motivated to understand that from the context of a, of a, a racialized, um, to understand about race and representation in that context. Brilliant, what a fantastic introduction to the evening. That's fantastic. Um, so what I'd like to do now is perhaps skip back in time a little bit, because you've already mentioned the Black Art Group and your colleagues, Keith Piper, um, Eddie Chambers and Donald Rodney and Claudette Johnson and um, Lesla, Leslie, Win Wenda Leslie, sorry. Yeah. Um, but what is astonishing to me um, talking to you is just how young you were when you came in contact with these other art students. You weren't even at art college yet. You were doing your foundation, as I understand it. And um, so you did, you, you started um, your, your BA at Bradford Art College in 1983, but you've mm. said that um, this poster from 1982, was, seeing this poster was a really pivotal moment for you. Yeah, absolutely. So what had happened was that I, I, when I, while I was doing my A-levels at school, um, I'd been researching into we had to do a piece of independent study as part of our A-level course. And I decided that what I wanted to do was to research black art, black artists. And I, I've said this many times, my, my tutors at school, my teachers rather at school, were really worried that I wouldn't be able to find any material because they didn't know any black artists. So there was almost this, this feeling that, that, you know, I, could, I wouldn't be able to find black artists because they didn't exist. Um, and so I've been through that process of um, having that response and then finding when I went to, when I did try to find black artists, what I found was lots of, well, not lots, but I found material about the black arts movement in the US. Mm -hmm. 
the, the sort of 1960s to 1970s movement that happened there. And so most of the writing that I did during that last year of my A-levels was about work that had happened in a US context. But I did manage to find one small group of artists that was based in Birmingham, which included amongst that lot, um, that's when I met Vanley Burke, the photographer. Yeah. And I also managed to, to make contact with individual artists that were based in the UK because there'd been a, um, an auction that had been organized by the London School of Economics. And there'd been a small, a tiny little article about the auction um, appeared in the, the Sunday papers. And one of my tutors at school found it and sent, sent, gave it to me. So through that route, I was able to make contact with Frank Bowling, um, Ronald Moody, and a few others, including Shaka Dedi, who was the, who would then go on to, who went on to, to open the Black Art Gallery. So what happened was that I, I went down to London with a friend and went to see the show. And then I just hand wrote a note to the, um, to the organizers asking them to pass on my letters to the artists. And that's how I'm going to get in touch with these people. And so I remember writing to, to Frank Bowling and to Ronald Moody because they were amongst the artists that actually wrote back to me. Yeah. But I think I wrote many letters and I think that I, altogether three artists responded and those were Shaka Dedi, Ronald Moody and um, Frank Bowling. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, so then, so I'd had all of this amazing stuff happen to me already. And then one Saturday morning, my mother dropped this envelope into my bedroom. I was being, I was being a typically lazy 17-year-old um, um, and she, she dropped an envelope on my bed. And when I opened it, I found this poster folded inside. What I hadn't realized was that my mother was working, it just so happened that she was in her, she was working with Keith Piper's father. They were both working in the same hospital. Wow. Both working for the, NHS and um, I can only assume because I don't think I ever found that I ever grilled her about this I can only assume that when they were they were, they both worked the night shifts so I can only assume that they compared notes about their wayward children and how <laughs> difficult it was raising children in the, U the UK and found out that we both had this interest in art and then because the the, um, the poster was addressed to me. So I think that that was Keith Piper's father sending me that poster. And so I went along to the, uh, the Icon Gallery, which was a gallery that I knew very well. I'd been to lots of events there. And um, I met Keith Piper there. And he was the only member of the Black Art Group that was actually at the opening. And he had, he literally had white paint on his hands because he'd just finished installing the work when we, when I got there for, you know, whatever time it was, six or 6.30 or whatever it was. And um, yeah, so that was really how I, how I got to meet them. But, but the point about the poster is that I'd read lots of radical black statements related to the black art movement in the US. And, you know, I, I, I'd kind of um, understood and got very excited by the prospect of those types of radical, um, radical aesthetics, if you like. But what happened when I opened the poster was that I was reading the same types of statements, but this time they were made by young black people from the same kind of background as me. Mm -hmm. And I realized that there was something happening right there and then in that same in my in proximity to me and that made me really excited so I remember very well that the hairs on the back of my neck stood up and I read this poster and it still remains one of my favorite posters of all the black art group posters even though it's it's just black it's so simple yeah yeah that's amazing I mean one of um 
it, one of my questions was going to be, what what on earth did your family think about you going off to meet um, a, a, an artist who was already at art college and then being recruited into an arts collective? But perhaps you've answered that question because there's a context um, if your your mother knew Keith's father. I'm not sure what they made of it, really. I think they thought I was a bit eccentric and that, you know, a bit of a rabble rouser and probably thought that it was better that I was getting involved and doing some of that. You know, there's lots of things that young teenagers can get up to that are, that is, you know, much more worrying than going to lots of meetings and putting art in galleries. So, um, so I don't remember my parents ever um showing any signs of worry about it right well you I'm, were I'm not sure that they understood what i was doing though well you were recruited really quick and um in our previous discussion you think that this work anti woman was shown in a black art group exhibition in 1982 so i was wondering um if you could uh, explain what it's showing and what your motivations for this for this mixed media piece was around the same time that i was um recruited into the black art group i i mean i i i would say that my politicization came through um just being curious and wanting to know more about my own history and um I started this habit of going to a black bookshop that was not far from where my school was, in, still in Handsworth, um, in Grove Lane in Handsworth. There was a Harambe bookshop. I can't remember what Harambe means now, but it's um, but the, the, it was the, the closest place for me to, to get hold of this material. And because I wasn't on a course or being tutored by anyone, I really literally used to wander into the shop, wander around the bookshop and look at book covers and titles and then decide based on the title and the, the cover of the book whether I was going to read it or not. And I came across a book called Ain't I a Woman, which was written by Bell Hooks. And she has remained one of my favourite authors. Um, and not just author, she's more of a, she's a thinker and a, an activist, as well as being a brilliant writer. So one of the things that I read in that book was the, a story about Sojourner Truth. And Sojourner Truth was um, an abolitionist and a feminist, an early feminist. And um, there is a famous story about her at a rally, and I think it was a rally for women's suffrage. Um, she was, she, she pulled, she tore open her her, her blouse and revealed her breasts and she was and she made a speech where she was kind of saying you know I I've had to work side side by side with men aren't I a woman and um or rather ain't I a woman it's it's a famous speech that she made I think it, I think she really I think it really did happen there is some there is some um, controversy about whether this really happened or not, but I've read about it in, in, in several different places. And so she became, a, a, I became obsessed with this idea that a woman should stand in a crowded room w where she would have been faced by, I assume a lot of white people, where she would have been um, intimidated by them, I, I guess, is what I'm thinking. And so I, I started to, I'm sorry, I've just been distracted by June Reed's post about Harambe and what Harambe means, but I can't <laughs> read it through, so I'm gonna have to read it later. But I was just so moved by the idea of this woman who was born in slavery who'd endured so much during slavery and who was advocating both um, um, and, um, abolition of slavery and universal suffrage. 
Um, and I was so impressed by her and taken with this moment that I made several pieces of work. I think this was the first one that I made. And if I can describe what it is, it's, it's leather. Yeah. So the, there's, there's, there's the black polythene, which is literally just sheets of black polythene that I've stapled over to kind of create a frame. Um, the first level is a pastel drawing. And I've just drawn the upper torso and the breasts of, of Sojourner Truth. And then there's a Hessian sack that I've split open to, to kind of indicate her clothing. And there are two hands. One of them is kind of more naturalistic. It's a, a brown hand with, I think there were some black felt tips that I used to draw the knuckles and fingers on that. And then there's a red and green, red and green hand, which was again, my kind of early um, introduction to Pan-Africanism. So I was thinking about the colors of that Pan-African flag. And then, then last but not least, there's a little um, pin that's got that, um, and, and the pin um, attaches to the Hessian. And I think on that pin, on that, sorry, on that piece of paper that's attached to the Hessian, I've written the quote out, but um, unfortunately I can't read it from here. So exactly. I think the quote from the, from Sojourner's Truth speech. Uh -huh. Amazing, thank you. Such a powerful work um, and so concise as well. Um, and obviously it's pretty clear that this um, image stuck with you because you went on, um, when you started college, you went on to make um, a, a three-dimensional sculptural version in mm. clay. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to say anything about the making of this work or... Yeah, the making of this work took up a, a large part of my first year was, was spent making this. Uh, I started off by making a, a small maquette, uh, which I made in the college. And then once I started to build this piece, and it's just about life size, um, it started to get the wrong kind of, um, the wrong kind of attention. I found it really, in, I'm using the word intimidating, I found it really difficult to make the work that I wanted to make in the space that was provided to me by the art college. Uh, I felt either completely isolated in that space or, or as if I was being, it's that whole thing about either being too visible or not visible enough. There didn't seem to be a middle space between the two. And um, it didn't help that one of my tutors, um, the way that we worked at Bradford was that you, you'd kind of rotated between one space and another. You didn't have one permanent space the whole time. You went from um, one building to another and one space to another. So um, it didn't help that the tutor that I was, that was working with me did a lot of quite um, kinky work. His work was quite s and &M. So he okay. did lots of lots of images of black bodies, lots of images of black female bodies. And when I say black, I mean jet black. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, he tried to kind of start up a conversation with me, with me about what I was doing in comparison to what he was doing, but I just it wasn't appropriate. And I, so what I ended up doing was moving myself and my clay into my living room at home in my digs. And I also, um, when I was trying to make this, I used myself as a model for some of it. And I used my very generous um, housemate um, who also sat for me. So, Cause I was trying, I really wanted to get the, I just wanted it to be, um, anatomically um, accurate mm. in a way that some of the other pieces that I made 
didn't need it. But somehow in the clay, I wanted to really bring this woman to life. I wanted to, to birth her. So, um, yeah, I spent a lot of time working on her. And, um, yeah, it was a, quite a difficult birthing process. Well, it's, she is incredible. And the visceral nature of her, you can almost hear her screaming. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, I, I'm quite happy with this this piece. What happened, unfortunately, was that um, once I moved it back into the into the college, into to the studio, uh, it was destroyed before I could take any more photographs. I mean, I don't know what I would have done with it. I think the thing to would have, would, to have done would have been to make a mold of it so that I had some lighter weight um, um, versions. Um, but I hadn't really made up my mind what I wanted to do with it. And the tutors in the clay workshop, in the pottery, decided that they needed the clay. So what they did was they put the whole thing into a, a vat of water and it got reconstituted back down to clay. So that was not a very happy moment for me. No, absolutely. Understandably, I was furious on your behalf. Um, but I so wonder... It was never shown anywhere. It, it, it existed in the studio only, which yeah. is, I think, is, is, is quite sad. I'm sad about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm wondering whether or not that, that some of that anger got channeled into these works. Because again, these are so resonant of violence and the way, and colonial violence and the other way that um, uh, African imagery and visual culture is stolen and taken um, by, by European um, uh, modernists, but also just British, the way that we are. Our museums are stuffed full of looted objects. Um, mm -hmm. And that these, these two works speak so powerfully to that, but also um, perhaps I'm reading too much into it, but perhaps also your own experiences. No, you're absolutely right. You've hit the nail right on the head. But, you know, in these works, I'm thinking, I'm contemplating and um, both that theft of um, African objects um, that are, you know, that are in all museums all over, all over Europe. Um, and I'm also thinking about violence, uh, colonial violence, but most, more specifically, sexual violence. Um, so the words on the uh, on the top that 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 kind of circle that head say the most. Oh, I've forgotten. Can you read them? Uh, I can't see it, and um, it's a bit small. Right. Let me just check. I think you've I, told me previously. Um, uh, the most sacred commandment, that's it, it's come yes. back to me. The most sacred commandment, violated. And then the second one says, and violated. Mm -hmm. And I used um, these images that I, from um, West Africa, uh, both the, 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 the larger image, I think it's called an akuba. It's a doll that is, um, that West African women use, um, which is related to fertility. So it felt to me like a sort of a stand-in for black or particularly African womanhood. And that's why I use it. I still, and I find them just so beautiful. And then the smaller image with which I've traced in blue is, um, from again from West Africa and I think it's a West African artist's version of a Portuguese slaver mm -hmm. 
So yeah. I wanted to kind of put them in the frame. Yeah. And, um, and yeah. that would that would make sense if he was a Portuguese slaver because the sort of circular amulets yeah. were tokens that were used to buy um, right. West African people for, yeah. to get for slavery. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now you made these works sort of around the time you've already mentioned. Um, you were a member of, of the Black Art Group at this time when you were making these works. And in 90, um, yeah, 1982, you and um, the Black Art Group organized the first National Black Art Convention at Wolverhampton Polytechnic in October yeah. of that year. Um, it's already been mentioned, but I'll just flag it again for audience members if you don't already know. Um, in 2012, Marlene um, was part of um, the Black Art Research Project, um, Black Art Group Research Project, and the website, um, which is available online, obviously, um, has a whole wealth of information about the activities of the Black Art Group, but also, incredibly, um, audio tapes of the convention. So you, we can listen to um, Rashi Darin and Frank Bowling and Claudette Johnson speaking um, as it, in 1982, which was is pretty incredible. Um, and as we've already mentioned, there's an, an older generation of speakers, Rashid and Frank Bowling, um, but also a younger generation came to Wolverhampton from across the country. So Lubaina yeah. came from London, Simrath Patti came from Leeds. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, if you could sort of reflect on um, what was it about um, this moment, this conference, that really made people from across generations working in different types of art, different media, what made them want to come together at this moment, do you think? I think, um, I think similar to me, um, lots of the, lots of the young art students found themselves in in colleges and art colleges where they were the only one and um the calling calling all black arts black artists and art students it's just a tantalizing possibility of community you know and so i think just as i had happily and gleefully leafed through books about what the radicalism of the um, black artists in the US and then got really excited when I finally met, met some young black artists of my own age and background. I think that that call it, it kind of lit a fire under people that really wanted to be in community and to have peers. Mm. You know, it's so lonely to be by yourself when 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 you're making art um and as you said um students came from all over the country and the thing about the day for me one of the highlights of the day was Rashid Doreen's keynotes on um art and black consciousness because for me he really contextualized what I thought I was doing and where I thought I was going and what was important. Mm. Uh, so, so he was one of the highlights. And the second highlight for me was Claudette Johnson talking not just about the ideas, but talking about her actual work. Mm. Um, and I think everybody who attended had this had a similar, similar experience. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. I just want to say, I, I first time I came across um, the two works, um, the violated works, was in Rashid's exhibition catalogue for the essential black art that he curated um, in, I think it was '88. Mm -hmm. um, but you've you've also mentioned that you is it? Am I right in thinking you carried around your copy of Making Myself Visible? Is that right? Yeah, I can't remember what year Making Myself Visible was published, 
But I can tell you that I had a copy and it was very well thumbed. And that sometimes when, particularly when I was in Bradford by myself and trying to do what felt in, like almost impossible in, in under siege, felt like siege conditions sometimes. Having the right book in your bag just gave me a little bit more confidence and a little, it was something to, to hold on to. Um, and I felt the same way. I mean, I, the things that I was reading. So Rashida Reed's Making Myself Visible is an, an astonishing book and I recommend it to ed, everybody because in it, he talks very candidly about his journey um, into visibility. And it's something that I, and it's a story that I, um, that really resonates. And then he talks about his first um, naive sort of um, excitement about modernist art and how much he wanted to be part of that movement. And he talks about the ways in which he was undermined and marginalized. And instead of being shamed by it, which I think is what happens with racism, is that when you are the victim of racism, you, you take on the shame of it, and that makes you silent. And Rashid, like many other um, activists, reminds us that we must not be silent. We must speak, we must speak, we, we must make ourselves visible. And um, so I found his, his work both inspiring and comforting. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, you've already mentioned that you met, how you came in contact with Shaka Dedi, but um, again, sort of in 1983, in your first year at university, you participate in the inaugural exhibition, Heart in Exile, at the Black Art Gallery, the first mm -hmm. exhibition at that gallery, which is quite astonishing to me. Um, the gallery was run by the Organization for Black Arts Advancement and Leisure Activities, and it had a specific remit to exhibit work by artists of African descent. And I was sort of wondering whether or not that was sort of a natural home for you, given the Black, the black art group sort of pan-African um, uh, sort of, uh, politics. Well, I, I think to begin with it was, and I, and I think this about my, my reading and about my whole journey into um, consciousness. Um, I think that at first what one looks for is like-minded people from similar backgrounds. That's where you kind of go to begin with. And then it's only after a while that you've got the space, I think, and the confidence to read a bit more widely. Mm -hmm. so, at the beginning of 83, I think it was 83 that the um, the Black Art Gallery opened. Yeah, was, so Heart in Exile is the first show yeah. in that space, yeah. When is that, is that September? 4th of September. So um, to begin with, I was really excited that, I was excited that there was going to be a place called the Black Art Gallery because it meant that there was a home that people could gravitate around. And that it really um, excited me that the next set of art students that wanted to find black artists wouldn't have to go through the mm -hmm. same process that I went through if there was a home for black art. So um, to begin with, I was really excited about the Black Art Gallery, but as my politics developed, um, like I said to you, I, when I was at, at Bradford, I went on the Shots Irish Squad tour, for example. So I really did have a, I wasn't sure that Pan-Africanism was where my politics would, would, would land. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's the same with nations. I think coming out of, in a post-colonial setting, coming out of, um, bondage and coming out of um, 
the colonial system, what tends to happen is that you get sort of nationalist governments formed because that's, the, the, that's really the simplest way that you can understand your subjugation is to understand it as, a, as, as something that's related to race. But when you look, up, look wider, there's the, the economics. You know, you can't really get around the economics and the economics are not about color. The economics are something much more fundamental. So um, I found myself working at the Black Art Gallery in 1985 to six when I took my year out. And I found that I would often get into difficult and um, uncomfortable conversations about around this whole notion of Pan-Africanism and the extent to which having a policy at the Black Art Gallery of showing only African artists, the extent to which that was progressive. Mm. So I, I thought it in the end wasn't very progressive. That's really interesting. Um, now in for this show, Heart in Exile, I've got it. I'm sorry, this is a not great slide. It's taken from the exhibition catalogue. But you exhibited a work called, or was titled in the catalogue at least, Ain't We a Woman? Mm -hmm. um, and what I think is really fascinating about this show is the statement in the catalogue that accompanies the image in which you critique head on the myth of the black superwoman, the woman who is inordinately physically and emotionally strong and whose life is one of sacrifice. And you state um, in your text that the women in your painting or mixed media collage painting are working just like generations of black women before them. But quote, what is different about these women is that they are that they will, they will not be caricatured cruelly into black Amazons, matriarchs, super strong aggressives and totally self-reliant. The black matriarch is a cruel and damaging, a corruption of the truth. Um, and you go on to say the black matriarch, um, however, despite the fact that she is a, a fiction made, made up by white colonialists, she continues in our psyche, in, um, you finish the text, in our kitchens, our canteens, our laundry, our hospitals. Um, and I was just, just wondering if you could speak to this idea of the black superwoman and, and um, how you were addressing um, that, that caricature. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, um, it's, it is not, it's, I can't deny that in my family, as in many other immigrant families from, from similar backgrounds. So my parents came to the UK in 1950s. And so I was raised by a whole generation of women who worked very long, very hard hours and who managed to raise their families, hold down a full time job, um, look after their their homes. And so because they're successfully doing all this, it's it, it's very easy to see them as superwomen and to see them as to caricature them as um, super strong. But that doesn't allow for any vulnerability, any failing, any loneliness, any um, weakness. And I very much wanted to, in my images, and I, I was working, I think you can see that I'm working through ways to, talk about these women, um, which doesn't add to the stereotypes. And it's very, you know, so I was trying to unpack what I wanted, what it is that I want to do with my art. And in a way, I do want to pay tribute to those women, but I don't want to do so by coming up with 
yet another set of cliches about who they are. Mm. So I, one of the things that I notice about my work at that time is that there's very little, I don't make them very beautiful and desirable. I make them quite, there's a lot of pain in my early works, I think. And I think that that changes as I mature. Mm. And then the work that I've made later doesn't even, I, I kind of move away from the body. It's as if I can't find a way to, 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 to work with the body that doesn't end up being about a body in pain. Mm. And I want to get away from the, I want to get away from the body in pain. I want to get away from the pain anyway. And it felt, it feels as though when I look on my work now, I had to, in order to get away from the pain, I had to relinquish the body. Mm. Well, if you don't mind staying with these works for a moment, so I think this idea of the clearly the this idea of the matriarch at the center of the family who is both strong and vulnerable is is at the core of this work, good housekeeping one, I think. And yeah. on the one hand, it reminds me of the sentiment that Bell Hooks talks about the that the houses and homes are women's space, they're they're a special domain belonging to women. But on the other hand, this work is a very chilling reminder that um, the cost of creating that nurturing space can be very, very high um, and very, very painful. So, um, and in the catalogue to The Thin Black Line, you state that, quote, the nature of our art is predetermined by the nature of our existence. So I wondered if you could, um, speak to that a little bit this that I mean you've already touched on it a bit but if there was anything else you wanted to say about good housekeeping one um just to say that I I think you're right I mean the pieces that we were looking at just a while ago were made in 1983 and this is 85 so I've moved on a little bit here and I think in this image it is possible to see both the strength and the vulnerability of this woman and the tragedy that it refers to is a real one. Um, and so I think that's what makes it quite chilling. Mm. Um, but um, what, more, what more can I say really about? Well, uh, well if we talk about um, just the medium then and the way yeah. I'm interested in the way that you're you, we've seen examples of your work that already include um, text and image, but I'm interested in this piece about your combination of text and family photographs and the sculptural object and, and how you were thinking conceptually about, about art making and how you combine your um, components. One of the things that we haven't talked about is that in, in, when I was on my foundation course, I kind of fell in love with Arte Povera. Mm. I, don't know, I still don't know whether to pronounce it povera or povera, but um, so, so when I was using those black plastic polythene sacks to frame the work, this is a part of, my, of the way that I've been influenced to think about materials. Mm -hmm. And so in this piece, um, the components are the text, this, this line that I draw, which is like a, a border, which is a, um, yeah, it's like a border, um, but it, it denotes the kind of edge of a door or the beginning of a building. So, and then my, and then I place the hand just inside of that, that um, border line. And the, the thing itself is made from chipboard, which has been cut into a, um, into a into the shape of a body and then what I did was I built up the body using um, plaster 
and it was household plaster and it felt important that it should be household plaster rather than the more refined stuff that we got in the art colleges. It needed to be rough and ready. And then that is, that plaster is held together with um, some chicken wire and the whole thing is then um, built on with some J cloths and J cloths for those that don't know are just these blue cloths that have been used for, for decades um, cleaning things um, and then right behind um, and then the face is um, I just drew the face actually it's um, mostly um, um, pastels that I used to do the drawing on the face and then the photograph that is just behind her shoulder I really wanted her to appear to be guarding that photograph and the, so the photograph that's just behind her shoulder is a photograph from my family um, from and it's the, the event that's, that you can't really see that's happening in there is my it's my little sister's birthday and my youngest sister's christening so it's a combined family feast and everybody's kind of photographed around this adorned table so it's clear that so for anybody looking at it it's clear that it's a family celebration um and yeah i, I was thinking on many different i was thinking about the complexities and wanting to um, indicate things rather than um, so you know I think that just by putting a few components together sometimes you can suggest something and I really like that about this piece that it's you don't see an interior I don't provide an interior but you can construct your own as a viewer mm -hmm. yeah. where in terms of the height of that piece I think it's about six foot high so viewers can can stand eye to eye with with the woman in this piece and they can also stand eye to eye with the photograph mm -hmm. um, and it's one of the the last times that i've made a, a physical body but i do think that this is quite a successful physical body um, and it is kind of like a, a body standing in for many bodies. Mm. One of the things that nobody else will know is that my mother did have a dressing gown that was about that color. So for me, it really, it really was a portrait of my mom. But you know, you'd have to know my mom to, to know that that is the case. And, um, and that photograph really did come from my own home but I think that viewers would see that 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 is that the photograph is something that is, is real it's, it's an object that's taken out of its out of its context and put into another context in the gallery but it kind of it almost it, it acts as a doorway um, into a different into a different realm mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I I was very, very aware of that. Yeah. I really like the way that your use of text in this work um, and the use of the words, my mother, because mm -hmm. as an audience member, I'm reading the words, my mother, and immediately thinking of my mother, yeah. but, but simultaneously think, trying to process, oh, well, the artist means her mother. And that ambiguity is, um, is a, a really powerful, complex problem as an audience member looking at this work and trying to um, position myself um, in relation to, to her. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad that that's working because that's what I want. I want to have a, a conversation. I want, to, I want the work to have a conversation with the viewer and I mm. want the viewer to see my mother but also see their mother and see other mothers and see other women of that age and background and not even of that background but 
of that age, you know, um, and to understand the vulnerability and in a way to understand how that vulnerability is being abused, you know, in certain, in certain households. Mm. So, you know, this woman is trying to provide a safe space, but, she, but ultimately she's powerless to prevent the bullets. Mm. Yeah, the external forces. Yeah, try as she might, she's not bulletproof. No. And the other thing about that I like, I like playing with the text <clears throat> of what, what nobody will know about this is that I, I, I was so, um, I was so twitchy on the day that we were installing this that I actually got asked um, Shutupa Biswas to, to do the actual lettering for me. So she actually got up there and painted the words. But I also was playing with the size of the text. So my mother is larger than opens the door at 7 a.m. Mm. So opens the door is a smaller text because it's an everyday thing, you know? She opens the door. 7 a.m. is big because I, I want to remind people that it's 7 a.m. 7 a.m. is a time when you are just waking. Mm -hmm. But if you're somebody like my mother who worked nights in a, in, for the National Health Service, 7 a.m. is the time that you're finishing your shift. Yeah. So I also want to, 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 to raise this specter of what time is it and what time is it in your household? And mm. so what happens at 7 a.m. in your home? Mm. And then is not bulletproof. Nobody is bulletproof. Not even the super, not even the black superwoman. No, no. Um, after this moment of um, the thin black line, in 1985, you've mentioned that you took a year out from your BA as a mm. sabbatical. And you, um, 1986 seems to have been an absolute furious um, explosion of activity. Um, I got exhausted just looking at what you were doing. So you curated um, Some of Us Are Brave, All of Us Are Strong at the Black Art Gallery. Um, you were exhibited in Unrecorded Truths at the Elbow Room. Um, and you also curated um, Starring Mummy and Daddy. And all of that, those three exhibitions took place between February and June 1986, which is quite astonishing. But you seem to be wrapping yourself um, in a, in a, uh, or surrounding yourself rather with this amazing cohort of, of women artists. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering if you could say something about this exhibition and why it was so important to you to put this show on. You know, I kind of fell into this exhibition. What happened was that um, I was working as an assistant curator, or in fact, back in 1984, Six. We didn't talk about curators so much as exhibition organizers. I think I was assistant exhibition organizer at the Black Art Gallery. So I was working with quite closely with Shaka, who was the director, and he was doing most of it. He, he was leading on the programming. And so the idea of putting on a show of women was something that he was not really very comfortable about. So I remember one of the things that I loved about working at the Black Art Gallery was that we had a kitchen mm. where there was a big table and a small cooker. And we used to spend a lot of time in conversation with, at lunch times, especially, we would cook for each other and then mm. we would have a conversation. And it seems ridiculous now, but back in the 1980s, it wasn't unusual to hear people talk, say things like, you know, if you're going to get involved in feminism, you're dividing the struggle. Yeah. So the whole idea that if women were organizing together, they were somehow dr drawing attention away from the wider and more important issue of race. Mm. 
So we had those types of conversations at the Black Art Gallery. And then to begin with, um, when, the, when the idea was agreed, and it was almost like it was like a round table discussion in the, in the staff room. Um, to begin with, Shaka's wife, Eva Kadina, who was the head of the education part of the, of the gallery team, um, initially it was in his Chaka's intention that Evi should lead on the on this exhibition but she didn't feel comfortable doing that because she didn't feel that she had enough expertise and so it fell to me to organize it and so what we did was very much I think I really just followed I copied what um, I'd seen Lubaina Himid do for the Thin Black Line because with the Thin Black Line Lubaina wrote to us all and then she invited us to come to her house and we sat and talked about what the show was going to be. And she provided tea and cake, yeah. and, you know, in a very kind of Lubaina Himid way. So what I thought that I would do, because um, I was living in a, in a um, flat in Islington, rather than invite people around to my flat, <clears throat> what I did was I invited people to the kitchen, to the kitchen in the Black Art Gallery, and we had a discussion about whether we wanted to put a show on or not, mm -hmm. and what the show would be about. And so we agreed that we would, the show would be, I think it was Amanda Holiday that suggested the title, and the title comes from a book of essays which I think I can't remember the name of the woman who um, edited that book it's somebody Smith but I can't think of the first name um, but there was a book called some of us are brave all of us are strong and we stole that title from that book and then um, as we we worked, what happens is that you have individual conversations with each of the artists and it just becomes more and more obvious that the show is essential and that it's really important to, it's really important to take up space and to be noticed and to have a voice and to, to, to say what is on your mind. And what we agreed with, some of us are brave, all of us are strong, is that we would, we would contemplate our mothers. And again, I think that's probably my, that was probably one of my influences, because as you can see, I'm, I'm kind of being as, as obsessed as I was with the image of Sojourner Truth. I was also, one of my obsessions was with that generation of women. And partly because I felt that they had sacrificed so much and it was payback time, really. Um, so all of the women that took part in Some of Us Are Brave wrote, um, made work. Most of it, if not every single piece, most of it was specifically made for the show. And I think that's another thing that happens a lot when you look at the kinds of exhibitions that were being put on at the time, whether it's a thin black line or unrecorded truths at the elbow room that Lubaina did she was she wasn't insisting that you make new work but she was creating a context into which artists wanted to create new work and so it was the same with some of us are brave um, I remember Lubaina's piece for this show was called mirror cloth bowl mm -hmm. it was an absolutely beautiful tiny quiet piece of work where she had an image of her grandmother, Marsha Lan, and then she had a little wooden stool and um, a, 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 a little towel rail, really tiny little one. And over the, on the towel rail, she had, um, she'd woven what would have been a towel, but she wove it out of paper little pieces of paper that she'd woven together. And it was just such a beautiful, poignant, quiet, um, 
dedication in a way to her grandmother, a, a, a sort of tribute to her grandmother. And I don't know if I thought it at the time, but I certainly think now looking back at images of Marshall Land, um, that Lubaina's physical, she physically re resembles her grandmother. Um, and Miracloth Bowl, to me, is a really intimate little piece that speaks so much about an intimate relationship between women of different generations. Um, so yes, I, I agree with you. When I think about it, 1986 was the busiest year ever. I think what had happened was that I'd taken the year off so that I was in London from the September of um, 1985 through to the September of 1986. So I had, a, I, you know, I only had a little window and I was just trying to get as much done as possible <laughs> to go back to Bradford. I'm just going to skip forward because um, sort of two things you were just talking about there, about making quiet, intimate work and moving, making work, stepping away from the, representing the body in your work, I think comes through really powerfully in the um, pamphlet for Unrecorded Truths in which you've written a poem which is surrounded by this black lace collar. Um, but the poem is, is about trying to make an artwork that is dedicated to a, a black woman. Or, um, and I think that was, that's a really powerful thing. So I was wondering if you could talk about um, your text and the way that you're, you're engaging with poetry and prose as well around time. I think that... Um... I'm somebody that loves words and very often when I'm making I start with words I don't start with a sketchbook I start with words and meaning and I I kind of work out what I mean to say with the words and then that leads me into choosing the materials and and making the making the the objects and with, um, with Unrecorded Truths, I think because that came after Thin Black Line and I can't remember whether it came before or after Some of Us Are Brave, but, but in, I know that in Some of Us Are Brave, I still had a, um, a cutout figure, the, the piece that I did for that show myself, I had a cutout figure still and in, um, Unrecorded Truths was the first time that I tried to make an image of a black woman or speak about her life without using the body. Mm. So it came before the piece that I did that's now at Sheffield Museums, which is, um, yeah, history. art history. Um, and what, what had happened is that where in art history I've I asked my mother to crochet something that the the case that that vase is standing in is cro is a crocheted vase and the vase is and the crocheted vase is then stiffened using sugar and water and in the unrecorded truths piece I tried to make something that was like that but I used doilies just paper ones and I just felt very dissatisfied with how that worked formally. I didn't feel like it worked. I mean, it worked well enough, that, you know, there was a good response to the piece, but I just felt aesthetically, I, I wanted to go back to the actual object. So, um, so yeah. Yeah. So you um, returned to um, your course. Yes. Um, it was, would it be the September of, 1986 mm -hmm. but just because you were on your course didn't mean you slowed down any um you curated with eddie chambers the image employed which was on at corner house in manchester that was um, with keith piper, not, not eddie sorry chambers. sorry sorry keith piper eddie chambers was included in the show sorry um but that opened in june and at the same time 
you were having your degree show. That's right. Which <laughs> included art history. So right. well, it was, it was just bonkers. Do you know what? I am so... I when At the time that we were doing all this stuff, it just felt like it had to be done. It was There was a sense of urgency. Mm. And so it wasn't... So at that time of my, in my life, it was very much it, have an idea and work on it straight away and get it delivered. Whereas now in my life, I'm very much more, I work much, I'm so much slower. Uh, things have definitely slowed down for me. But at that time, it just felt like there was a burden of representation that one mm. had. And there were things that needed to be said and things that needed to be put out in the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I had, I felt like I had to do it. So um, the corner house um, opportunity came up because they invited us. Um, the corner house actually invited myself and Keith Piper to, to, co to collaborate on the image employed. And that was a show of, I can't remember how many artists were in that show, about 12, I think, 12 or 14. Um, and that was a huge undertaking, mm -hmm. but it kind of made sense for me because I was coming towards the end of my, I was doing my final year at, at um, Bradford and I wanted to have a context. And the, for me, the college never provided the, enough of a context for me to, for that to be all. Mm -hmm. It felt very cut off from the real world. And so I, I wanted them to consider the work that I did for the image employed as part of my degree. Mm -hmm. um, and it worked and didn't work. I think that partly they felt like I was being a bit of an upstart <laughs> because I think this was it. I didn't, I didn't really involve any of my tutors or any of the other students at, at, the, at the college in the image employed. And I think that they, um, because of that, they didn't really, I don't remember them saying well done. Mm. I don't remember them particularly coming to see the show. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's astonishing given that, that Corner House was a major space, mm -hmm. um, a major exhibition space in Manchester. But I'm conscious of time, Marlene. Okay. And, um, I wonder whether or not um, there was anything else you wanted to say about history, because in terms of what in Lizzie's introduction, she talked about art and the world. And um, in many ways, art, I think art history does that really beautifully. It talks about the real world and the art world and how these two um, can join or can coalesce in some way. Um, I was wondering if there was anything else you wanted to say about that. No, you've said that really beautifully. And I mean, apart from saying that the postcards in, so I've, I've already said that, that that art history, the vase was made, was crocheted by my mom. So it's the only time I've ever collaborated with my mother on a piece of work. And I'm so pleased that I did that now because she, she passed away a couple of years ago. And I, so that work, means even more to me now that, that she's no longer with us. Um, so she crocheted the vase. The flowers were donated to me in by Trevor Matheson, whose mother also passed away. And he, he heard me um, distressing myself because what had happened was that the, the original flowers, plastic flowers that I'd used in the piece, um, were no more. I think I'd used them for um, various other pieces of work and actually not even for work, um, Alice, I'd used them when my daughter had dressing up days. Of course. All the, all the plastic flowers had been used for, for halos and fairy, fairy dresses. So um, um, I had to, so I was asking people, asking around and asking people who had plastic flowers because I couldn't find any online or anywhere because now we don't have plastic flowers anymore. We have these really wonderful, really well-made 
um, fabric things that look like real flowers. And I didn't want that. I wanted the original old fashioned 1970s. 70s 1970s plastic flowers that you could wash and so luckily for me Trevor Matheson was, was um, kind enough to let me have the, the flowers from his mother's house and then the, 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 the um, images on the right hand side are all drawn from art history so the first one is oh gosh I'm going to forget I'm going to forget names um I won't tell you what they all are. Monia Lewis. There you go. I was just about to say, Lizzie will have to jump that's in. It. That's it. She's Edmonia Lewis, who was this astounding woman who, even despite the fact that she was born into slavery, managed to be a successful artist in the 19, in the 1800s. Uh, there's a self-portrait by Simone Alexander. There are the hands of Madeleine Adondu, um, photographed by Ingrid Pollard. And then there's an astonishing photograph by Brenda Agard of a writer that I don't know her name, but it's Brenda Agard's image. And the, the image is titled A Portrait of Our Times. Mm. So, it's, so they're all very powerful images made by other black women. And the whole thing sits on this shelf, which is kind of, I like to set it up to, to be about the same height as a mantelpiece. So it kind of gives you that sense of mental peace. Um, and I, I first made that piece for my degree show. And then I showed it, you know, 30 years later in the places here. And um, I showed it at um, Sheffield Museum's um, retrospective of the Black Art Group, which was in 20, from 2011 to 2012. It's mm -hmm. one of my favourite pieces, I have to say. I think it's I think it's wonderful that you did it for your degree show because it speaks so powerfully to your A-level tutor who said that there weren't any black artists Absolutely. and and here they are in yeah. your degree show as you're about to well I was going to say about embark, embark in the world as as an artist but by this point you'd already curated and exhibited um, so widely um, and established yourself and your career. Um, I know that there are lot, there's lots of chat going on. Right. And I wonder if there is, um, uh, there'll probably be lots of questions, but I just want to very, very quickly just flag that your film Rehearsal 2 is currently on um, display at uh, New Art Exchange in Nottingham in a show called Cut and Mix, curated by Ian Sargent. Um, and if there was anything, again, you wanted to say about this, um, address, address rehearsal two. Yeah. Just to say that I made a piece called Address Rehearsal, in, which was a performance piece that I did in about 2014, 15. And so this is a second version. In the first version, I'm dressing and undressing and talking about my relationship with my parents. And originally when I made that piece, I thought, I thought that the work was about them, but it ultimately ended up being a sort of more about me than about them. So I'm not sure if I like that. that <laughs> um, and then I've made the second version. Um, when I made the first version, my mom was still with us. Um, and in this version, I'm older. Um, I made it this year, so it's a very recent piece. Um, but it's still talking about those family relationships. But I think it leaves a lot more to be guessed at. And I, I like the enigmatic nature of this piece. And, um, and in the photograph that you can see there, there's a photograph of me with my daughter on the shelf above me. Mm. And, uh, my daughter's called Wesley and she's named after my dad. And in the photograph that you see there, I'm wearing my dad's clubber. Well, I'm wearing his waistcoat. Um, in, in 2014, when I did the first version, I was able to actually get into my parents' clothing, but I've put on weight since then. <laughs> so that wouldn't have been a possibility. But mm -hmm. I'm in, in a dress rehearsal one, I talk a lot and I dress and undress and I play 
lots of music from my parents' music collection. And in a dress rehearsal too, I play one or two tunes and I sing along mm. and dance. So mm. they're quite, I really like them as a pair, as a, as a pair of, of works about, about temporality. They really are about time and space and relationships. Mm. Oh. Well, Marlene, I could um, sit and listen to you talk for, um, hours more but uh, I think we probably have to stop at this point yeah. so <laughs> it's a great shame I'm really sorry um but Lizzie I don't know if at this point we've got time for a question or two yes. or yeah I mean I yes I'm sure we're all sort of burning with questions but there it has been a question in the chat box for a little while so I did want to get to it it's from Nicholas Brown um, so Nick writes, uh, huge thanks to both the speakers. Always wonderful to hear you. I wanted to pick up on something from very early in the conversation. Um, can you recall which specifically of the US Black Arts Movement texts you and the other Pan-African Connection Black Art Group artists were influenced by? What were the points of resonance, but also differences as this was embraced and reinvented within the UK context? Oh my goodness. I can't remember what we, what we were reading in those back then. That's a really <laughs> question for me to answer um I, and and because i've been asked that i um i can't remember any a single text at all to even fair enough well you've you've oh, mentioned pre you've mentioned previously tony morrison and alice walker as sort of for, for certainly for me and for claudette and for the other women around tony morrison and alice walker were really important writers for us i think it might be different for the boys um but um yeah those those authors and you know morrison in particular for me i read um i read a compilation of um um black american black american women authors writing in about 80 283 um, and in that compilation were some excerpts from Toni Morrison's Bluest Eye and it was I couldn't once I'd read the, the, the those excerpts I couldn't wait to get to the book and it still is for me one of my favorite or um, one of my favorite novels of all time and and you know I love all of her work Brilliant. Thank you so much, Marlene. And yes, no, fair enough. I can barely remember what day of the week it is most of the time. Nevertheless, what I was reading uh, a long time ago. But thank you so much for such a generative and generous conversation. I feel this is such a such an interesting conversation. And I think really that is a really nice end to a series that wanted to open up these relationships between you know, this thing that art is and the practice of art making and its relationship to, to the world, um, both personal and political. And I think your practice is so rich and, and again, so generative for doing just that. Um, right, so yes, and to that end, I, it is now almost eight o'clock and I thank you both again for joining us, for being so generous in conversation and also, to everybody who's followed along um, at home and to the Paul Mellon Center team for your support across the entire series. So that's it from us folks. Uh, thank you so much. Night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, Marlene. Bye. Bye, Alice. Bye. Bye.